All right, welcome back, Prospect Live viewers and listeners. We're back with another big interview this week. I, of course, am your host, Ralph Lifshitz. Joe Doyle is joining me, and a man who needs no introduction, uh, one of the more well-known, prominent voices here in the baseball world. That is Needham High School alumnus. Had to throw that in there as a Massachusetts. <laughs> Carl Ravitch, welcome to the show, Carl. How are you? Thank you, Ralph. Joe, good. I'm doing great. And I uh, appreciate the Needham shout out for all those rockets out there. That's uh, that's great. And my, my most my, my best man at my wedding there. is from Needham. So I had he knew I had you on. He said, you know, you, you got to give him a Needham shout out. So oh, I had right? I had to all give right. a Needham shout out. I know? see the Bruins uh, wheel over your shoulder. So you're a Boston guy. I am indeed. Indeed, I'm a bad fan, though, because there's a Bruins game on right now that we're both missing because Joe, uh, yeah. you know, a future yeah. a, a future uh, Kraken fan. <laughs> Sorry, man. Out. I'm in Seattle. Like, we don't have any hockey to watch right now. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Bruins, Not yet. I can say this. For, for, for whenever you run this, currently, while we're recording it, the Bruins are leading 1-0. Oh, oh yeah. gee. All right. Well, depending on how long we run right now, things could get a little <laughs> a little uh, off the wall. All right. Well, let's jump into it. Uh Carl, I'm going to hit you with the hot uh, the hot take question right now. 3-0, bases loaded, you're up by seven. Are you swinging? Yeah, I, I guess my answer to that is, look, the pitcher puts you in a 3-0 position. Now he's looking for you to help him out of the 3-0 position. I, I, I'm not I'm not into that. I do think at some point, and, and I'm guessing, you know, ironically, the, the weekend – they were ahead in the fifth inning, I think even by more runs. And Machado had another, I mean, Tatis had another 3 0 count and he swung. And that was in the fifth inning. So we asked Jace Tingler about that. And he said, Look, let's, if we're playing the Dodgers and they take Bellinger and Betts uh, and Seeger off the field, we may behave differently. But in the fifth inning of a game, if they're still playing, we're not doing that. So, yeah, I, you know, the pitcher put you there. I don't think it's your responsibility to get yourself out of it. Yeah, and I mean, it was funny to sort of see what the reaction was in the days following. Um, what are your sort of your big level thoughts, uh, you know, high level thoughts on unwritten rules in baseball? Are there some that you agree with, others that you don't agree with? Um, certainly the 3-0 thing is, is different. I don't know why anyone would agree with that. You score runs. That's why they put you on the field. I mean, look, we, we had Johnny Bench on our game the very next night. Yep. He echoed those same sentiments. I've seen a lot of veteran players. And by the same token, um, we've had a couple of the managers, Kevin Cash. We don't swing 3-0 and in a situation like that. So it does sort of vary team by team, manager by manager, situation by situation. Uh, you know, the unwritten rules to me are um, the, the idea that you don't throw at a, at a guy's head. Um, sure. doesn't say that anywhere, but you should never do that. And there are guys who throw with such velocity and they do know generally where the hell it's going. The idea that you're going to throw up at somebody's head, uh, that, that to me is about the only unwritten rule that needs to be followed because it is written nowhere. Um, and you risk, you know, doing some significant damage or worse to a player. There's no room in the game for that. That's garbage. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think the unwritten rules or, or the the swing in 3-0, the you know, stealing a base late while, while you're up by whatever amount of runs, do you think that's part of the branding and marketing issue that Major League Baseball is kind of currently running into? Well, I think I think I think as the game gets younger, um, you know, the marketing and the branding uh, is going to change. Uh, you know, it's interesting. We had a conversation on our game about uh, who you think like this has to do with your Little League thought. We had Steve Keener, the president of Little League, on after we announced that deal with Little League for the next, I think, eight years. Um, you know, the players who go there from around the world and in this country are always asked who their favorite player is. So it's an interesting kind of conversation. Who is the favorite player of current Little Leaguers? You know, and the names range from Juan Soto uh, to Fernando Tatis, because he was playing in the game we were doing. He's clearly going to be one of those guys whose name pops up lot amongst these 10 and 11 and 12 year olds um where where would mike trout fit on that list would would miguel cabrera and albert pools get one vote um so i think as the game gets younger the marketing the branding and all those things will change um i think baseball would suffer from the idea that these unwritten old school rules are the way they're they're going to go forward with marketing and branding i the they let them play and all those things, I think, are the future. That That's the way they should be going. Yeah. 
kind of switch it up a little bit here too, but I think it's sort of in the same vein, <clears throat> just in terms of where the game is going. And I think you see this contrast, certainly, you know, on television programs that cover baseball, you see it um, within the pages of sort of, or screens of any sort of website or publication that covers baseball, but it's sort of this clash between um, analytics and, and sort of the new school mentality. Some people like to call it the three true outcomes versus, you know, uh, folks that may look at it from a more traditional standpoint and, and sort of their argument tends to be taking the athleticism out of the game. You've been around the game long enough. You've covered it at a high level. You've, I would imagine some insights into that. So, you know, how do you sort of, do you think it's a negative sort of the, the amount of strikeouts we're seeing, you know, the advanced approach, some of those things that are maybe a little bit different from years past where the game could be, we'll say more athletic, but was more contact oriented as opposed to sort of um, the most runs scored possible, which is kind right. of my perspective. Is. Yeah, look, I mean, there's there's way too many strikeouts. Um, there's mm -hmm. probably too many home runs. This year's a little different. This year, you know, it's down a little bit. And this this year is aberrational for, for every different reason. Um, so I think I think if you talk about analytics and you talk about old school and you threw them into a, a big pot, you'd end up with, you know, David Ross and Aaron Boone, um, Alex Cora last year, A.J. Hinch. Um, you end up with managers who recognize the value of the analytics and you also recognize the value of the eye test and talking to a player, finding out how he's doing that particular day, that week. Um there's no question that there's there's enough of the pie to go around that analytics gets a prominent place in it. Um, you're 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 recognizing old school talent, putting Mookie Betts in right field and moving Bellinger into center. That that that's masked in analytics and his ability to run a ball down and arm strength. But again, that's attaching words to observations that were made throughout sure. the history of the game. You know, generally the guys that are great analytically are the ones who would have been highly scouted. It's not a, a huge secret. Um, what happens is you do run into these, um, we're bringing in the lefty specialist to get that guy out because all the numbers tell you that guy can't hit this particular pitch. And we have that button to press to bring in that guy who throws that pitch to get that guy out. Where in years past, you would say, I need uh, Joe to come in because Joe throws lefty. And that's a lefty batter. Therefore, that's going to favor the team who's pitching. Now it's more specialized. Now it's we have Joe and Ralph who are both lefties, but Ralph throws this pitch more often than Joe does. And mm -hmm. that guy can't hit this pitch. So it's be, in a lot of ways, it's become sure. uh, more accurate, more pinpointed, more scientific. But it, it's very difficult to argue the numbers, you know, that's the, the numbers never lie. There's a reason that that's true. They don't. Um, doesn't mean that we're bringing in the real specialist, Ralph, to get Carl out because Carl can't hit him. And all of a sudden, Carl takes Ralph out of the yard. That That's going to happen. But the percentages all play to that decision. So long answer to your question. There, there's room in the game for all of it. Um, and those that use both. Uh, are the ones that are going to succeed. In the end, uh, I think the most important aspect, since we all have access to those numbers, mm -hmm. is the ability of the manager to take the message from the front office, get it to the players so that they can understand it using analytics and speaking a language they can understand it. Your ability to communicate and have a feel for the game in the seventh, eighth, and ninth inning is more important than you know what page 13 says about getting the number three hole hitter out. <laughs> Just kind of a quick follow-up too, Joe, if you don't mind. I mean, we're, we're a scouting-based site, and we certainly lean into analytics. But I'm much more of like an eye test guy. You know, my, my sort of go-to is going to minor league games, going to the Cape Cod League, identifying players early. Right. You know, I'm working with the TrackMan guys to get that information and sort of, you know, work that into my evaluations. But the thing that I always wonder, and especially going back and, you know, uh, having been around minor league baseball as a kid, I grew up near, you know, Pawtucket but there were a ton of Pawtucket Red Sox games. I saw a lot of that stuff. You didn't see guys throwing as hard with right. the kind of movement that guys have now, at least yeah. from what I remember now, it might be, you know, bad memory, but even at going back six, seven, eight years. And I wonder how much, you know, the rap Sotos, the track men data, all of that sort of advanced coaching that focuses on sort of these, you know, slight differences 
in, yeah. in, in, in um, you know, variants that you can get in terms of movement and all that yeah. sort of stuff, how much that sort of played into the amount of strikeouts and even the approach from the hitters, because guys weren't seeing 93 mile per hour sliders with, you know, significant drop years ago. Yeah. I, I think that all those tools, uh, I think there's a couple of things. I think more and more, especially the, the college programs and the high level college programs, they all have it. So mm -hmm. you're now taking athletes in at the collegiate level who six, seven years ago didn't have access to those tools. So you're now taking it's it's literally like taking a, a kid uh, who's an artist in high school and then dropping them into uh, an advanced art class with great teachers, with great tools. And you mm -hmm. can then accelerate their ability to do what they do really well. Yeah. You put a pitcher at um, any SEC school with all those tools mm -hmm. and they take that raw stuff and you put it in the oven and you bake it a little bit. And it tastes a heck of a lot better year one and year two and year three than it did when you first had just ingredients. So all those all those things make for better pitchers, which if you do have a high spin rate, um, we're going to capitalize on that. If you don't, we're going to capitalize on that somehow. We're going to have you become somebody that just locates. You'll, you'll, you'll be Kyle Hendricks if, if that's what it's going to take. And Lord knows he gets people out. So I think the use of Rapsodo and Trackman and making sure you're you're coming out of the same tunnel with your pitches all take somebody like, um, uh, I don't know, Walker Bueller, um, uh, whoever, you know, great, both, you know, Dunning and Singer at Florida. Like they have access to these tools that 15, 10 years ago, the guys that were there didn't. Um, yeah. That's why Alex Fajardo became a great pitcher. We, we have right. those tools. He's got the arm. Let's do something with it. Casey Mize, another example, just showed right. up in, in the major. So th those tools, to me, make the guy who has the raw stuff better quicker because you can read all the numbers and, and see all of it. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, one school that's done that a ton is Wake Forest. Wake and Forest is exactly, they've been, exactly they've been right. They've been targeting – a lot of these Northeast guys, Jared Schuster, who was a first rounder last year, yeah. the improvements that Schuster had made from July of, of 2019 right. to the guy that was out, you know, early in the spring and then was drafted by the Braves. And then, you know, Ryan Cusick is another one they're bringing in. It's crazy what they're doing with a lot of these guys. So well, I, we, we were down, I'll, I'll let you go. <laughs> we, we were down, but we were down at Wake Forest a couple of years ago, my son and I, and um, they were literally in the beginning of, of, of building their facility down there, mm -hmm. you know, and Tom Walter was excited and they had certain donors who, who gave them their batting cages and you could see what they were going to do with the pitching. If you want to compete, um, you know, in the ACC with the Carolinas of the world, if you want to compete in the SEC with the Vanderbilts, you recognize like we can get the kids, but this is the chicken and the egg thing. Mm -hmm. We're only going to get the kids if we can get them to the pros. And the only way we can, the way we're going to help get them to the pros is to show them this unbelievable facility that has the latest and greatest technology so we can take them and form them into what eventually is going to get drafted and they hope the first or second round. So Wake Forest is a, is a great example. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about the draft because it sure seems like it's something you are, you're very up on. You do a lot of college baseball. Um, is, is having ESPN pick up, the MLB draft this past year, especially in, in the middle of a, you know, of a pandemic. What did that mean to you? What did that mean to host something like that? And I guess the second part of that question would probably have to be, where do you hope ESPN's coverage of amateur baseball goes in the, in the coming years? Well, I, I you know, we do, we do so much of it. Um, it's probably gets overshadowed by things like little league and, and gets overshadowed by major league baseball. We do a ton of it. Um, Hardly a day goes by where I don't think about the idea that Major League Baseball just renegotiated contracts with uh, Turner and with Fox. And I know that ESPN is sort of on deck, if not in the batter's box, trying to do the same thing. And, you know, that can go one of two ways. You extend it or you, you lose the rights to it. And when you lose the rights to it, what's the next thing that happens? You know, to me, you 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 have much more college baseball on. I mean, you certainly have the ability to do that. You know, we go to Omaha every year for the World Series. I, I always think, and I've proposed, and I'll continue to propose it, you know, ramping up to the College World Series, we should have 
We should have a marquee game on Friday night um, from either one of the SEC schools where they're always great, ACC, Pac-12. It wouldn't really matter to me. But you should, let's say, for the month leading into Omaha, um, maybe six weeks out because then you get into the regionals and super regionals. But you show great college baseball on a Friday night where you're, you know, your you're two Friday night guys are going. They're likely going to be drafted. Um so you can sell the game and ramp up to Omaha that way. So I, I'd like to see a heck of a lot more of it. Um, it's out there. It is out there. You need to go find it on, you know, SEC Network, ACC Network, ESPNU. And look, ultimately, we'd love to see the draft in Omaha uh, right before the World Series. And ESPN does, at the very least, the first round again. Um, the ratings were spectacular on ESPN Network. We did do it, by the way. We had it. I hosted it years ago when we first broadcasted it at, uh, at Disney World. So there was quite a few years in between, um, you know, and MLB Network took it over. But I, I love doing it. Um, Kylie McDaniel was terrific on it. Um, you know, there's, there's just a lot of voices that that have access to the collegiate game, whether it's Burke or Peterson. Those guys are fantastic. Uh, Mike Rooney is brilliant. So... Yeah, I, I'd like to see more of it. I'm I'm a very big fan of, of uh, the college game. I, I like it. I love their attitudes, uh, whether it was TCU or Arizona. I mean, they have fun playing, you know. Tim, you guys know. So Tim Corbin comes to the Little League World Series a few years ago when Goodlandsville, Tennessee is in it. That's just outside of Nashville. And he said, you know, Ravi, the, the beauty of this is this is, the, this is kind of the last time. These are 12-year-olds. The last time that these kids are playing with their friends – and they're playing for the name that's on the front of the jersey as opposed to playing for the name that's on the back of the jersey. Meaning showcase is not about being on a team. It's about what Doyle or Ravage, you know, what Ravage can do. So um, that's, I, I, that's why I really like the amateur side of this a lot. Yeah, and I think with, you know, the expansion of social media and the expansion of, of access to, of these, you know, these collegiate programs and these collegiate games, the, the sport is going to continue to grow on the amateur yeah. side of things. Um, my question as a follow-up would be the NBA draft, the NFL draft. I mean, they're these marquee, just monster rating events. This was the first time in a while that, in my opinion, that the MLB draft had, you know, front line and center, the eyes of the nation in, in the sports in the sports center that is um do you think there's a point or an opportunity here where the big league draft could actually work its way into the same conversation as those you know nba or nfl markets or is the immediacy of that talent being on display always going to kind of put mlb a little bit behind probably i mean i i think we have to see where the sports themselves go um you know, if all of a sudden college basketball becomes watered down because the NBA comes up with a league in which the players can be drafted out of high school and immediately put into a professional rank, that, that probably would change the way that we watch the NBA draft. Obviously, you touched on it. The idea that you you play at a major college, you get drafted, and you're you know the running back for the Cowboys or the Packers or the Lions or the Patriots the next year. Uh, that that's why there's interest. I mean, <laughs> in a lot of ways, one of the main factors is gambling. You know, you, people watch football to gamble. If if yeah. I know a quarterback is going to get drafted and play for my team, um, that's going to impact my ability to watch and my desire to gamble. So th there's that vested interest in what that player is doing, especially in football. While in college, and then is my team going to get him? Oh, awesome! You know, we 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 just picked up quarterback from Clemson. We now are going to have much more focus on what we're doing here. Um, you know, in Green Bay. Uh, so I, I think that gambling is a is something we don't touch on a lot when it comes to taking player from college and getting him into the NBA or the NFL, Major League Baseball. It takes a little longer, but we are absolutely seeing now. How soon and how quick? And this is a, I think this is a great evolution. And I think the collective bargaining agreement, rather than stifling getting the young player into the majors after six years uh, of control, is going to change. It has to. We're, we're, we're having 20 and 21 and 22 year olds play. They got to get paid for what they do when they're 21, 22, and 23, 
not for what they're going to do when they're 29, 30, and 31. It, it, it's a bad formula for the player, and the owners know it. And as long as they're going to play the Juan Sotos and Tatises of the world, you know, and the Bellingers and Dustin May and whoever it may be, you got to get paid for what you're doing, you know, after one or two years, not after six. Because by right. year seven through ten, you're not the same dude. You only get one shot, and if you're not performing up until that, you know, age 28, 29, you, you never hit your payday. Yeah. You just don't. Yeah, I agree. And there's other guys that sort of max out early. I mean, you look at a guy like Andrew Benintendi, and the player that he was in 2018 has certainly not been the guy he's been in 19 and 20 now that he's going into those actual arbitration years. It's right. going to significantly hurt him uh, long term. I just want to mention it's the second interview in a row we've done in a week, Joe, where we've gotten a good Tim Corbin story. So <laughs> That's true. We can try to book That's Tim true. Corbin at the next interview, I think, so we can oh, tell. He, yeah, he, he, he's my he's he's a probably my favorite. He's got that thing, he's got that thing humming down there. And back at his mm. buddy at Michigan's not not bad either. There's a lot of yeah. look. There's a lot of great coaches. He he and I have just struck up a friendship for a while. We've known each other um, for a long time. His wife's a sweetheart, Maggie. So yeah, he's solid. But there's a lot of solid dudes in, in college baseball for sure. Yeah. He's a good and it's dude. A tremendous program on top of that. I just sort of, I want to mention this too. I do think that, you know, we did see something unique maybe a year back with Kumar Rocker's sort of performance in the, in the college world series. He's a name that, you know, I use this term loosely, but we'll say like a casual serious baseball fan. So someone who maybe knows a little bit about prospects follows their particular yeah. team. Yeah. That's a name that people know. And, you know, Joe and I being guys that obviously spend most of our time covering the draft, Right. You get a lot of questions about that. But I think, you know, having those games, as you mentioned before, on a prominent stage, yeah. you can really take it to sort of the next level that there is some name association, even with a handful of players. Um, and just seeing, you know, how exciting some of these skills are, because a lot of these guys, is even though being a year or two away from major league impact, m more often than not, the big stars in the game, in the college game, are polished enough that they really don't need A ball. And, you know, as we're sort of seeing mm -hmm. the, the shrinking of potentially, at least maybe not in 2021, but certainly in 2022 with the new CBA. And uh, you know, I'm hearing that the PBA, the you know, professional baseball agreement with the minor leagues might get extended. But how do you think the game is going to be impacted if we do shrink the minor leagues? The college game is going to have more talent, more of a crunch for talent. It's going to push guys yep. down in different divisions. Yep. The mid-majors are only going to get better, and this yep. is certainly a sport where mid-majors are competitive. We saw what Coastal Carolina did a few years ago. How do you sort of foresee that playing into it? I mean, that could be a relatively big windfall in terms of talent for, you know, high-level college baseball. Yeah, I know. I don't think this, I think this – I think college baseball is looking at uh, what may be their best – best years um, ever. I, I think if you're going to reduce the draft number of rounds, mm -hmm. um, that's a disincentive for players uh, not to go to college. If, if I'm going to get drafted in the seventh round or after the fifth round, uh, I'm going to college for two or three years because look what happens when you go to these programs. Again, it goes back to the Rapsodo and the Trackman and the facilities they mm -hmm. all have. Yeah. You're getting, you're getting unbelievable coaches. Just think of the number, just look at the number of coaches who have left prominent programs to go to the major leagues. <laughs> if you're, le if you're leaving uh, Vanderbilt and you know, you're going to the Cincinnati Reds. Um, uh, if you're now on the Minnesota twin staff and you used to, you know, be a pitching coach at, uh, in the ACC or SEC and I'm a kid, uh, Wait a minute. Why would I? Why would I go ride buses, stay in lousy hotels, when I can go to these programs, eat right, get coaching, uh, get an education? Which, by the way, should I don't know why that just gets thrown out the window. Many right. of these guys actually go to class uh, and are forced to. Corbin and others require it. Like you, you have to. That's part of the deal here. Um, this is only going to be, I think, the, the glory days of, of college baseball for the reasons we've touched on: a shorter draft. Um, the idea that Major League Baseball is recognizing uh, and maybe they can help out with an additional scholarship or two somehow to these programs that the minor leagues aren't really a, a great breeding ground for mm. for our best players. The colleges have got a down pat. They, they figured it out. How can we actually work in unison with college baseball and and improve that so that eventually when they get to us, They've got this experience. They have great leaders. They've been exposed to uh, different facilities. They've eaten better. They've taken care of themselves better. That's who we want 
you know, in Major League Baseball, if we can get them exposed to the college game. And to the credit of Corbin and Backage uh, and Sullivan, uh, Mississippi State, Ole Miss, uh, wherever they may be, Oregon State, sure. um, you've got to harvest not just from premier prep programs. You've got to be able to go into inner cities because uh, th those there are some gems that come out of inner cities. I mean, just look at the makeup of the Michigan team that played in the finals last year. They were They were from all over the map. And that yeah. was a big selling point for Backage. I think his line to us was, we want our our roster to look like the United States of America. We don't need it to look like prep school one and prep school two, which is, which is brilliant. And you, you know, you can, you know, let's, let's go after the best athletes, get them into our facilities and see what pops out the other end in three years. Mm -hmm. You know, speaking of, of, of that inner city, inner city baseball culture, um, you had a chance to, to host the draft this year and, and talk at length about Ed Howard coming out of Chicago and being part of that Little League World Series team. Right. Um, you've been doing Little, Little League for 20 years now. I mean, you've kind of been uh, one of the major faces of those telecasts. I've wondered, you know, there's guys that come through that system, the Cody Bellingers, the, the Randall Grichicks, the Profars. Yeah. Do you do you grow close enough with those teams and those players during the telecasts to when those guys eventually reach big leagues? Do you do you recognize the name? Do you remember the game? I mean, or is it just too far removed? I would say that I would say that the player remembers the experience uh, and maybe the interview that we did with them more than than I would. No, I, I yeah, I would like Bellinger has, has brought that up before. He sat on a set. Um, and I'm not even sure. It, I think it was with me, actually. But he was a real shy kid. Um, and we've played that interview before. Like, I would have zero recollection that it was Cody Bellinger who was part of that team that was sitting on the set with us. Um, mm -hmm. But, like, for the profile name, I remembered. Um, I'm trying to think if there's other guys. There was who, Conforto. Who, who, who would Michael they get? Con yeah, no, like, I don't. Who, who, when they got to the to the show or even to college baseball, I, I would have to be kind of triggered to remember. Oh yeah, he he played for that team from Florida. He he played for that team from California. The, you know, it's very difficult when you're doing that event to. Uh, Monet Davis is the name that stands out. Like if Monet happened to go on to something special in in any field, whether it's athletics or not. I will I will vividly remember that experience because she was, uh, you know, obviously at that age, a girl, and she was spectacular. She was a huge story. Sure. On her on her team, there were probably three guys that that you could project as well, they could they could keep playing through high school and maybe go to a, a big time college. Um, would I remember them? Probably not. But so it's it's difficult to sit there and say I remember that guy. You're talking about kids from Japan who are probably more gifted than most of the United States players are when they get there, especially pitchers. Um, mm. Look, th there was this kid, Reese Roussel, last year at the, World, at the Little League World Series from Louisiana who like, you literally couldn't get him out. He set the record for hits in a World Series. I, think he had, I forget if it was like 17 or 22. Now, if, And because the name is so recognizable, if Reese Roussel shows up at LSU – and then goes to the major leagues. I will remember him, but he was really unique in that year. He he stood out. So very limited, but but there is a, there is a chance, and that also speaks to you know my senility. I'm getting older, so it's harder to retain things. <laughs> what about Big Al that hit dingers? I mean, yeah, I don't Big, know Al. Big, Big Al. Al. Even if even if you run into that guy in the street in 20 years, you're going to remember Big Al. <laughs> well, if Big Al talks like Big Al does now, I'll remember. I'll, I'll be scared. Out of mind if I hear oh that man, voice I can only creep hope. up behind me. Oh man, hey, hey, Carlos, Big Al, I hate Big Al. <laughs> I, I'd run like hell. You know, the other part of that, though, every time you get a team there, you know the the, the shortstop who goes and pitches, he's always the best player. Oh, yeah. Names blend together, but they, they, every team has standout players. Well, I, I want to hit you with a, uh, one other question. I don't want to don't want to keep you too long. During the draft, or, or maybe just prior to the draft, you uh, you held an interview with the commissioner, with Commissioner Manfred, and it, it felt as though in that in that interview, 
you know, at the time, MLBPA and MLB, the owners, they were at an impasse. Uh, there was, you know, no traction. It, it felt almost as though you were, you know, representing the casual fan in a way by saying, you know, hey, point and point blank, what's going on? Like, why can't we get this done? That's sort of a mentality. Can you kind of walk us through how you went into that interview and, and kind of your way of thinking with the entire ordeal? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, what I remember about that and, you know, full disclosure, he, he and I are, are, I would describe it as very close relative to uh, reporter, broadcaster and commissioner of a sport. And that goes way, way back to when he was the lawyer for Major League Baseball uh, during the last strike. And we, we, you know, he, he was the guy I would kind of go to to get uh, any insight as to where we were going with uh, negotiations. So that, that relationship goes back a long, long way. Uh, what happened that night was he, I think, inadvertently kind of put words in my mouth. Uh, and because we have a relationship, I think, that is that is based on trust, like I'm not here to, to go after you. I don't think you are here to hurt me. But, you know, he sort of said something that implied that I had come up with some particular number as far as number of games, Um which I said, well, no, 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 that's not what I would have ever said. Those were your numbers. My numbers were let's play 60, 65 games, uh, you know, and, and let's start here and, and go. Um, it, it was interesting because several players reached out to me privately on Twitter, who I'd never heard from before, almost as if to suggest, you know, way to go. You really nailed them there and you were representing us. I hope to your point, Joe, I was, I, I'm, rep you know, I've always come at it from, the perspective of baseball fan. I mean, baseball, that's what I, that's what I do. When I sit there and host a show, uh, I'm curious about all 30 teams and I'm sitting there as a pirate fan, red fan, Royal fan, Red Sox fan. doesn't matter if there's a great play or a great player. You, you want to talk about that. If there's a mistake or some decision that was made, let's ask about that. I, I, I really, I don't have a rooting interest in any particular team. I grew up in Massachusetts, but I've already seen the Red Sox win World Series and break curses. So I, as I tell people who ask, I root for time zones and temperatures. If we're going to the World Series, get me the heck on the West Coast and make it warm. <laughs> Not, if San Diego could be in the series every year, sign me up for that. It's better than sitting outside when it's 34 degrees in, in Philadelphia or Chicago. I, you know, So I, that's that's what I, that's my rooting interest, regardless of of the team. Um, but with regards to Manford or Tony Clark, you know, I, I'm not, I don't have an agenda and I think that serves you well. John Crock, you know, the great John Crock told me a long time ago and I've seen it. He's as um, unedited as you can get when it comes to critiquing players or decisions. Um, and I think as I watched him work with me for years, there's a great level of respect generally from the player who knows a former player is being honest as opposed to sugarcoating or hiding something or protecting. Um, everybody can see through that. And that, that was a valuable lesson that I learned from him when he, he can be pretty cold and cutting. Uh, but when he walked into a clubhouse, he was like the most popular guy. They, they wanted to talk with him because they knew he generally had the best interest of, of the game and the broadcast. And there was nothing personal about any of it. I think Manfred and Clark know that anything I say, there's nothing personal about it. But if I thought one of them made a mistake or did something I thought was, you know, stupid, I'd say, I don't understand it. That was stupid. Can you explain it to me? In my opinion, that was stupid. Explain that decision to me. In that case that you're talking about, I think I felt like he was putting words into my mouth and, and they didn't taste good. All right, Joe. Well, I don't have any questions myself. Uh, Carl has been nice enough to give us over a half hour of his time. So, uh, Mr. Ravitch, I want to thank you for joining us yes, here on the Prospect absolutely. Live uh, I guess it's the draft interview show. because We do two shows a week, but I do want to thank you for all your candid answers and information and uh, keep on doing the great work you've been doing. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for reaching out to me and thanks for all you're doing for, uh, for amateur baseball. It's, it's greatly appreciated. Of course.